to the Brothers MacLeod. Hello. Oh yeah, boy band set up. Excellent. There we go, yes, there we go. Hello. Um, Hello. I've got my clicker. So uh, we are the Brothers MacLeod, which is going to put the, uh, there we go, that's us. There we go. Oh, the wrong way around, there we go. And we are the wrong way around. Go. I'm going to move this thing up so people can see. There we go. Um, so yeah, we've called it a bit of this and a bit of that because that's kind of what we do. Um, we do bad animation, uh, animation, screenwriting, illustrating, illustration, and uh, we also do books. Um, keep ourselves nice and busy. Um, we do get asked quite a lot if we are actually. I'll, I'll come over here. Oh, right. so okay, some, you do no, that. no, because there's, oh, there's people around the corner. That can't oh, okay, see if you're over there. Confusing so. me. I'm gonna um, are we actually brothers? We have photographic proof. Yes, we are. There so we go. this is me in uh, tartan hot pants and a and, uh, white uh, I've got some lovely dungarees. I think it's probably the last time I wore dungarees, actually. Possibly. You should never wear Maybe them I should again. get some... It was the 1970s. So I don't wear red either anymore. Yeah. Oh, there we go. This is what we're going to look like when we're older as well. Yeah, there so there you go. go. So. You've got the whole gamut of us now. Okay. Um, what are we going to talk about, Miles? Well, um, our career is a kind of patchwork of a bit of this and a bit of that. And uh, because that's kind of the way... I think they call it a portfolio career if you're calling it a, a posh name, don't they? But it really, uh, we just kind of thought we'd guide you through, uh, in a very random way, stuff we have done yes. to in order to pay the bills, uh, which will include uh, animation. And, of course, there's a lot of stuff for children's TV there because that's a big part of the industry in this country. Uh, although in the beginning, we kind of wanted to do like... Uh, kind of a grown-up sitcom animation, we which we're still plugging away at. Indeed, um, more of that later. And um, But we're going to start with some recent stuff. So uh, this was out on Milkshake on Channel 5 uh, last year. We originally came up with this idea... 12, 12 years ago. 12 years ago. It took 10 years for someone finally to uh, give us the, the actual money to make it. So it was a long process... And this was 40 episodes. Uh, each one was seven minutes. It's kind of for preschool, so it's like for four to six-year-olds. And uh, it was made uh, here and uh, animated. We, we did all the pre-production and post-production, and then the animation was done in Ireland. And it was all done through the pandemic, and not a single person was in the same room the whole way through it. So yeah. it was all done remotely, which was taxing, but fun. And it was all animated in... Ireland. In Flash. In Flash, in, well, sorry, Which is yes. now called Animate. animate which yeah. is just confusing to call something Animate. I know. So, how did you animate this in? Animate. Yeah. What? But everyone told us we, should, we yeah. shouldn't do it that way, and we just did it anyway, so there you go. Um, so these are our... We, we've also been publishing some uh, books, the Knights of Louis series. Um, this is, again, something that took 12 years to get off the ground. Um, it was something I wrote originally for my son, and then I, I drew it for my son, and you wrote it. And then it sat in a drawer for ages, and then you got it back out again and sent it to a publisher, and they went, oh, this is good. Yeah, it was kind of... And that was partly just because I think when it originally was written, uh, it was all right, it was this one. Um, but it, after 10 years of working, doing TV stuff, I got better at writing. <laughs> went back and went, oh, this bit's a bit rubbish. And then, uh, and then we sent it off to a few places... And you get, you know, the usual response of, oh, we like it, but we've already got something about nights. Or, uh, oh, this isn't for us, it's very silly. Or uh, other kind of annoying responses. And then yeah. somebody, Guppy Books, did like it, and they published it. And now um, we do, the last two weeks, we've done quite a few school visits just because it's been World Book Day. And, and it's nice because, actually, what happens with books is you don't get paid as much up front, um, and you might not make as much money out of them, but people... You have a lot. You have more connection with your actual audience. Like kids last week were actually dressing up as characters from these books, and that doesn't tend to happen so much when you work in like TV, for example. You don't often get to meet your audience very often. No, and this is the we did a little trailer for the, this book. So it's just based on a, a little short, a short I'm going to talk about later, which is our three six five film. So this was the trailer for the latest book. With that, and you don't oh. audio. Any audio on it? Probably turn over again. Let's go for the start again. Ready? Go.
Um, so the, the takeaway from all that really is stick with it, because both of those ideas were 12 years in the making, essentially. We both liked those ideas. At the time, other people didn't like them, and eventually they did. So I think we were both... We never like, put them away. We always like worked on them, and, and eventually yeah, we, that paid off. We did change aspects of them as well. Like We kind of bent in the wind a bit, and... Uh, I think like the Circle Square one was originally supposed to be 11 minutes, but then Milkshake wanted seven minutes. And so you're like, fine, you can have seven minutes, you know, as long as you put it on the TV. Uh, but yeah. yeah, definitely the kind of... So this is one of the things that really uh, kicked off our career. So uh, because we did a lot of personal work, we've always tried to mix like stuff that we think is commercial that's going to pay the bills with stuff that just feel like doing. And so this was uh, something that, that Greg created because, again, you were kind of... Uh, sending postcards, weren't you? Yeah, so I was sending postcards to my son at the time with these little weird little drawings and was sticking them on his wall and I kind of went in the one day and went, oh, that looks like a storyboard. Um, there was no story, it was just like one thing after another, but I tied it all together with sound in terms of the tone of the thing. Um, and there was two, two, two films on screen at any one time. So there's like multiple stories being told. And it was only three and a half minutes and, and we didn't, at that point we didn't really know about the, the film festival circuit or BAFTAs or any of that stuff. But we were doing a bit of work for Ardman and they said, oh, you should submit it to the BAFTAs. And we ended up getting nominated. Weirdly, Ardman ended up beating us with their Wallace and Gromit Well, they, they had Wallace and Gromit. There would have probably been some kind of public outcry yeah. if we'd beaten pub. And Wallace their budget and was four million and ours was about 400 quid. <laughs> ours so. was no, nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so we got beaten by Ardman, but that was fine. But that was, yeah, so that was uh, obviously very helpful to two, you know, people from the Midlands who no one's heard of. Uh, you get, you know, a BAFTA nomination. It you know, helps you get other work, obviously. Yeah, and then other stuff. This was a short film that was kind of a commission at the same time. Mars had written it about the first ever phone call back from Mars. Um, so that was that one. That was a really nice piece to work on. Uh, Marfa was a short, um, again, got nominated for a BAFTA, which was great, and um, which I made about a trip I did to America. More of that later, if we get time. Yeah, it's actually, the, 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 oh, yeah, we'll do more about that later. Yeah. Okay. Um, this, was, I, this came out of the back of making Circle Square. So we had, I'd been working on Circle Square for 18 months, working on a preschool show, and then accidentally made a film about a dancing chicken because I needed to do something that wasn't I, preschool. I think, I think we can blame the pandemic for this one. I think, I think so. Like... Yeah, it's a bit strange, but I quite like it. It's great fun. There's some more. Yeah, it's about chickens and ice cream and a uh, serial killer chicken or something. An and aliens. aliens. Yeah. yeah. Um, Very Peak was an experimental film with, we did with a sound designer. Basically what happened was I animated 10 seconds, I passed it to the sound designer. He did the sound for that 10 seconds and then another 10 seconds. He then passed it to Miles, who did dialogue for that. and then kept, So it kept going round and round and round. So we didn't know what anyone else was going to do. So no. it was just a bit of fun and it's completely bonkers. But uh, uh, He did a few sci-fi festivals, which was fun. So that's good. Yeah. Um, 365, so that was a short, we, I had this crazy idea that through, I think it was 2013, I would animate one second a day through the whole year, um, and then it kind of snowballed from there, we got massive social media following, and I carried on and we finished it, and it did really, really well at film festivals. And the other thing that happened was, it got spotted by loads of people, including Disney and Nickelodeon, who all wanted to work with us off the back of it. So this is the kind of story of us doing something that's very, very personal, that led to other stuff. So um, it was literally, I'd, what I'd do is I'd animate a second a day, I'd then post an image from it on Facebook and Instagram and all the others. Uh, and then at the end of the month, I'd show that month's um, and, clip. And each day was, there was no particular rule, was it? Apart from no. Some of them were like a, maybe a dream Greg had had, or I think that one was you had a pain in your hip. Yeah. Uh, there was, uh, I think you must have had a phone call with France because the guy's got his zappy thing with the French flag. Yeah. And so, and some of the, so some of them were little, ideas you'd had i think that was because uh it was our grandfather's uh, our late grandfather's birthday and he looks a bit like that except not a tomato and he did play the banjo and he used so, to grow yellow tomatoes so. and he, oh yes he and yellow was his all favorite color something. so th it was all like every day was a, a kind of slightly different reason why it was there yeah. so but every I, I, single day had a separate yeah, sound as well didn't it, it did I, I didn't want the sound to be like continuing throughout every I, tr I treated every second as a little mini movie um so i'll show you one of the months and this is march I think, from what I can remember. Yeah.
think I was having a bad day that day. <laughs> yeah. So it's about seven minutes altogether because it is, and it is 365 edits. It's quite an intense watch it's in quite, the cinema. Yeah. So it's. Um, but off the back of that, um, so I went to Pictoplasma, which, if you don't know about, it's this amazing festival in Berlin, which is all to do with character design. And um, we met a couple of people there from Disney and various things, and they asked us to say, well, can you do an ident for us? Um, and that was an interesting phone call because they phoned up and goes, we, I'm sorry, we've only got this amount of money for it. And I was like, okay, that's fine. It was like more money than we'd had for anything ever. So that was <laughs> nice. So um, basically they wanted a, the equivalent of 365, but for them. So we then designed this for them. And I'll just show you quickly because it's super short. But you'll see how, how it refers back to M365. There you go, nice and short. <laughs> yeah, and actually, uh, we'll probably talk about that later, or you might want to know about it later. But actually, that's the funny thing about sometimes, you know, a client will phone up and say, We've got this amount of money, can you do it? And other times, I'll say, How much will it cost? So that's always fun because yeah. then uh, it's a lot simpler when they just say, Hi, we've got a very large budget, which doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> then he's, Oh, of course, yes, that's exactly how much this is going to cost. Um, yeah. Um, uh, reverse engineering budgets is a good skill to learn. Um, so this, and then all of this stuff, it all came off the back of that. So they, we did the ident, we delivered it on time and to budget, and they were very professional about it. So they just started giving us more money to make different things. They said, "Have you got any ideas?" And we said, "Yes, we've got this idea about this little guy." And then we made that, and then we they, they gave us some more money, and we made another thing for them, which was this thing called the Nowhere Room. Um, and then they gave us some more money for this pranks giving thing. So the the, bit, the pitch for this was they wanted a kind of wily coyote roadrunner thing, but with a turkey and a pilgrim. Um, so this was like a t over a two year period of them just like chucking money at us and saying, please make some things for us. Um, and we learned a lot during that process. And the great thing about this was they were talking, they said, how are you going to do the sound? And we went, well, normally we'll do it ourselves. And they went, well, we can give you the access to all the Disney sound libraries. So they literally sent us this link, and one of them was all the original old Warner Brothers ones from all the Bugs Bunny films and all that. So we, we used all of those old Warner Brother noises for this. Um, so that was really good fun to do. Um, again, this was more that they asked us to pitch a little web series, so we, we, we did that for them. Although that was, that uh, leads me on to another thought, because this one actually didn't go through the full process, because what happened was, what often happens, is somebody uh, who commissioned us, then left and went and did something else. And if you're working like that with a with a corporation, you'll often find suddenly there's a massive change in direction in the middle of a project because the people involved are not the same people that were there at the beginning. And that can uh, often be quite a frustrating process. So, yeah, uh, but it's not unusual. No, not at all. Um, so I guess the takeaway from that is that personal work can lead to commissions. A lot of people think about it the other way around, that you'll get commissioned to do something and off the back of that you make a personal project. We've always kind of flipped that around the other way and we've always made personal stuff, even when we've been super busy with other things. So, I think it's a way of just kind of yeah, keeping your uh, voice, isn't it? Your creative voice alive. Yeah. Um, Miles, over to you for writing. Writing pathway. What have we written here? <laughs> this is a new thing. We have, I mean, we haven't done one of these at a university for a, since before the pandemic, yeah. not together. So you're guinea pigs for this so new talk. Pick, <laughs> so I'm going to read off the screen so I know what I'm talking about. So right, right, yeah. So my my uh, uh, kind of skill set is I'm a writer uh, and a uh, screenwriter. And obviously I write books and I've, written, I've even had poems published, uh, which is definitely not a way to get rich. Uh, but um, I thought, well, I want to write my own shows. I want to create my own shows. How am I going to make people uh, in the future, uh, how am I going to convince them that I'm able to do that? And I thought, well, the, the, clearly one of the things I've got to do is try and get work on other people's shows. And then uh, if I can write for other people's shows and write on other people's series... Then at some point they go, oh, we know he can write because we've seen it, and you know. So I've done a lot of stuff. Obviously, in this country, I've done a lot of stuff for children's television because if you're writing animation, um, there's um, a lot of you know most children's TV series have got 52 episodes, so they need a team of like six to ten writers to write those. Um, obviously, now there's increasingly more games work as well. We live near Leamington Spa, so there's a lot of, you know, you can see that that's always growing over there. I did write for some games uh, a long time ago. I wrote for like a SpongeBob game and uh, iCarly, and I even had to write a Bratz game as well, which um, 
which are still not recovered from. So, uh, so that's what I did. I thought, well, if I write for other people, I'll, I'll be a, I'll be meeting people, which is networking, and b, I'll be improving my skills, and c, I'll eventually be able to, you know, convince people that I could come up with my own show. And so that was that's behind that. Uh, I still do courses, and I still go and do other sorts of and. Um, I've just finished reading a book about how to write crime fiction by Patricia Highsmith, who wrote all the talented Mr. Ripley stories. Uh, because I thought, well, I don't know anything about that. So I think, um, but you also, that's also a great way of making other connections. And actually, the, one of the first ones we did was with a guy called Alan Gilby, who was the tutor. And when I went, tried to, I, came, I finished my screenwriting course and I went, oh, how can I actually get a job? And so I, I was looking in Broadcast Magazine. I saw that this particular show had just been commissioned. I thought, well, I'll write to the producers. Hi, I'm a new writer. Can you really give me a go? Uh, and it turns out the head writer was Alan Gilby, who I'd been on the course with. So I'd accidentally done some really good networking. But, um, but that, you know, that shows you how networking works. It is a lot kind of um, uh, writing for yourself. Uh, to maintain a creative voice, yeah. So that's um, you can tell I wrote that because that doesn't make any right. sense. Writing, writing for yourself, yourself to maintaining, to maintaining a creative voice, cre yeah, that doesn't make any sense. No, I should well. stick to drawing. We can definitely. edit that. We can edit that later. Okay. Yes, <laughs> um, it's a good deliberate mistake. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that, I mean that is the other thing. Sometimes I think it's tempting to think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do lots of work for other people, and then one day I'll work out what I want to do, and I'll get round to it then. Because by then you'll have forgotten how to listen to your own you know, creative voice and so try and do lots, of, you know, even if they're like little side projects or uh, little short stories or I've always, we've always tried to do that. Yeah. Um, I don't know what do it to prove it means. It sounds a bit marketing speak to do me. Do it to prove it. Yeah, oh, well, that is, that, you came up with that. Did uh, I? So, oh, it's, embarrassing. It's, <laughs> no, I mean, no, but, but what it means is the, the, the annoying thing is even now that I've done, I mean, I've got, you know, a lot of credits for children's TV uh, if I uh, if I went to someone and said hi, I'd like to write a feature, they'd be like, well, or to work on someone else's feature, they'd be a bit like, well, we're not sure you can do that because we we've seen you've written a book, we've seen you've written some poems, we've seen you've written for preschool and for like uh, older kids, and we've seen you've written comedy, and I'll, you know, but unless you've actually sat down and written perhaps your own feature, they won't believe you can do it a lot of the time. So sometimes. I mean, for example, a lot of the time I've I've, I've written a half-hour live-action drama for kids' TV. I've just, at the beginning of this year, written a 40-minute play, which is not for kids at all. So sometimes you kind of just have to find space. And this will be, you know, will be relevant to whatever your practice is, not just writing. Sometimes you have to go away and do the thing that you want to do <laughs> on your own and then show, look, I, ha I can do this. I prove to you that I've done it because I've bloody well gone and done it myself and here it is so we've had to do that a few times in our yeah. career to make people see that we have the ability to do this other thing that is sort of like but not exactly like the thing we've already been doing so it's a little bit tedious but you know that does happen yeah. that's what do it to prove it means excellent i knew okay. about something um Fair. so we get asked this a lot do you do stuff for free don't do stuff for free but so this is a story, if anyone knows Adam Buxton, he's a very successful comedian, very, very funny guy, he runs a very cool podcast. Um, this is like a while back, he phoned me up and he was doing a talk at the V&A Museum about David Bowie the next evening. And he said, I've got a three and a half minute bit of uh, stand-up I've done, can you animate it? And I said, okay. For tomorrow. For tomorrow, yeah, really tiny budget. Um, so it's three and a half minutes. So I said, uh, okay, because I love David Bowie and I really like Adam Buxton. And I, luckily, I wasn't that busy at the time. So I kind of strapped in for 24 hours and, and uh, this is what we made. Now, but I had to kind of come up with an animation style that would was doable in 24 hours. So I'll show you, the, show you this clip. Uh, and it's relevant because it actually, again, it's one of those things that we did that led to some other work. So here you go. Hello, Brian Eno. Hello, Tony Visconti. <sighs> I just got back from Paris. Ah, uh, yes. How are your legal wrangles with your former manager, Michael Lippmann, progressing, David? Oh, Brian, it's just awful. I'm not sure I've ever felt so low. Ooh. Channel it into the music, David. I suppose so. So, what have you been up to while I've been away, Brian? Well, I've been working on a piece of music, actually, David. <laughs> if you don't like it, I'll use it on one of my weird albums. 
you want to have a listen? Yes, I'd love to hear it. I could use some cheering up. Uh, could you roll the tape for us, please, Tony Visconti? Yeah, sure. I mean, I am co-producing this record, so it's not a big problem for me. Doing a lot of co-production, probably more than people think. Here we go. So, <laughs> there you go. What do you think, David? Can you use it on the record? Oh, yes, absolutely, Brian. I might just add a little something, though, so I won't feel so bad when people assume I did it on my own. Good idea, David. What sort of thing were you thinking of? <laughs> well, it's a rivetingly depressing piece of music, Brian. It reminds me of the train journey I took across Poland recently with Jim Osterberg, a.k.a. Iggy Pop. I think I might just step inside the vocal booth and freeform some impressionistic word decorations. Get ready to capture the magic, Tony. Yes, I will, David. I'm co-producing this album, so it's not a problem. Would you like me to put this through the Eventide harmonizer? It fiddles with the fabric of time. It's okay, Tony. Just a bit of reverb would be splendid. Thanks. Bit of reverb from co-producer Tony Visconti, doing more than people think on this record. How's that for you, David? I'm in a scary cave with bats. That's lovely. Thanks, Tony. Okay, here we go. I once went to Warsaw On a train with Iggy Park What I saw From the windows of the train Was depressing What do you think, Brian? Is it too on the nose? I think it may have been, David, yes. <laughs> uh, perhaps it's time to use the oblique strategy cards again, Derek. <laughs> uh, yes, Clive. That sounds like a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing the Derek and Clive voices, David. <laughs> so do I, Brian. Co-producer can do Derek and Clive if you need it to. OK, let's take a look at the first card and see what unexpected creative directions it sends us in. It says, beer, offal, cocaine for the weekend. Oh, no, I think that's just the shopping list, Brian. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's try again. Right. It says, do like a made-up language that sounds kind of Italian. Can you do that, David? Well, I can certainly have a try. Here goes. Just a one cornetto, lolly beef, a laura, laura. Geppetto, what's the matter, you? Why you look so sad? Shut up your face. I think we've got it, Brian. Co-producer loves it. Uh, maybe just one more, David. No way, I've done two takes. Stuff it up your bum. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Well yeah. done, Greg. That's. Uh, I did. I, I looked a bit strange after 24 hours of lots yeah. of coffee and that. So, but you yeah. did manage to do it in one day. I yeah. did. That's a yes. lot of that. I don't advise it. Right. But again, that came was that, that was an opportunity that came along, and you get a lot of these, and you go, okay. So it's Adam Buxton. I love his stuff. I love David Bowie. I've only got 24 hours. I don't need to sleep. It's yeah. fine. I'll do it. But sometimes you'll get people coming up and saying things, and you go, no thanks. And again, he had quite a. I mean, YouTube is always like evolving from what it was originally when we. Uh, when it started, but he yeah he put that up eventually, and then that got quite a lot of uh, hits there. Yeah, as well. so we and, did, and, and then I did a Star Wars one for him, and I did another David Bowie one, and all of that's online on our Vimeo or YouTube channel, so you can go and watch those. Oh, his, yeah, yeah. But they are like, so that's the, uh, the the David Bowie um, the one we did, um, and that all sort of started to snowball. So um, off the back of that, we got work with um, Edgar Wright, which was um, animating um, some little inserts for his Sparks documentary. Um, that was a nice phone call. Um, so we did all that stuff, and that was really great, and that got shown, and I got to go to the premiere and all those kind of swanky celebrity stuff things. Um, and then I got a phone call from Stuart Lee. If you don't know, Stuart Lee's a really good comedian, and they, he was making a film about this band from Birmingham and this kind of gorilla statue that was there. Uh, so I got to do a bunch of animation for them as well. And that was all off me saying yes to Adam Buxton, and because they're all friends and connected, um, he was recommending me to them. So that, that recognising those opportunities is really good. Um, this was the King Walker thing. Lots of other images from that. Um, so that's quite intense. So we're going to have a little <laughs> moment just to just this to is, relax. This isn't ours. Though. This isn't ours. This is um, by Peter Serafinovich, but it's uh, it's quite good in the middle of a talk that's quite intense just to have a moment to relax. Welcome to Dalek relaxation for humans. 
take a deep breath in through your nose. Now exhale through your mouth softly. Focus on slowing down your breathing into a calm rhythm. Inhale. You are becoming more and more calm. Exhale. You are feeling more and more relaxed. Inhale. Calm. Exhale. Relaxed. Inhale. Calm. Exhale. Relaxed. Inhale. Calm. Exhale. Relaxed. Continue to breathe slowly and calmly. The aches and stresses of daily life are floating away. Your tension has been exterminated. Exterminated! Everyone feeling better? Do you feel good? There we go. <laughs> Right. Okay, we're ready. We're ready so the now. takeaway from what we did before, not the dialogue, is don't turn down work if there's a potential for it to lead, get you noticed, and which is what exactly what the uh, David Bowie thing did. Uh, however, if someone says there's a tiny budget, but it was a really good opportunity for you, good for your career, then tell them to piss off. <laughs> Because that we all, we've been offered that a few times. Quite a few times. Like, oh, this will be good for you. This will be good for you. Yeah. And then they, you've never heard of them, and what they're doing is like totally sounds totally boring. I'll oh, be really good for you. And you're like, no, no way. Um, there's some other things that um, we got commissioned for. This is an interesting one. So we had we got very excited about this. They found some old tape of the Beatles talking to Kenny Everett, and they said, "Can you animate it?" And we were like, well, "Amazing!" We used to love the Beatles when we were kids, and we went to we, they paid us, but they, we animated it all, and they went, "Oh, we can't show it because of copyright issues." So that's never been seen, but we had a lot of fun making it and got paid, so that's fine. At least you got paid. That's yeah. Some, yeah. Make sure you get um. paid. Uh, and these are some other things that all came off, like commission stuff. This was for a, a magazine in America that wanted to do a piece on a chef, so we got to animate all these nice pictures of food. Um, we worked with Amy Nicholson on her short film about how, how all yeah. her animals died. There's quite a lot of opportunities where like live action things need animated inserts. So actually, yeah, I mean, we've had quite a few jobs like that, haven't we? We have, yeah. And then lots of other things. We've made a film about sticks. We did some a music festival idents, some BBC bite-sized stuff about dinosaurs yeah, and science. Those and ones, yeah. So the, uh, quite a few things we worked on have also required bits of kind of educational research. There's usually someone. So it's trying to make that a bit more interesting than you know, like well, one's about this, one's about physics, one was about dinosaurs. Yeah. There's some kids stuff that we did for CITV based on little kids actually coming up with their own stories and then them animating them. Yeah. And. Uh, don't listen if you're told. That Not. should be you are told. That's an apostrophe R. -E. See, this is why I shouldn't write things. <laughs> don't, don't look listen. at that one. Anyway. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, we were told several times not to do certain things. One of them is don't make a, a half an hour pilot for an adult animation show. So we went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah. So this was the first one we did, which was Eyeless Bag, which we made a while ago. This is before we were even capable, really, of doing it, but we're really proud of it still. Um, so that was when we nearly got that onto BBC Three, but not quite. Again, that was because the hierarchy yeah, changed. The, the people changed. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm not sure I was quite ready to write something like that at that point. No. It had good things and bad things, but the thing is, by doing it, we learned so much. Yeah. So it was like, it's not a waste of time. And, and one uh, of the things we learned was how to get some funding, because we got some funding via the European Media Fund, which you can't get anymore for obvious reasons. <laughs> Thank you very much, you bunch of idiots. So anyway. the, yeah, but um, that is another thing is trying to, I mean, we are, you know, essentially a creative team uh, and we have, a, you have done our stuff with like money, you know, you know, like um, writing budgets or applying for funds, which we'll get into later. But it does help to have someone else that's really an expert at doing yeah. that, like a producer. And it, this, this was something that I made a little clip of. Miles wrote the whole thing. He did it as a radio play, so the whole all the audio already existed. Um, and then I kind of animated a bit of it, and we really liked it. And then. A friend of mine runs an animation team out in Malaysia, and during the COVID pandemic, they had no work to do. So he said to me, have you got anything? I said, yeah, we've got a half an hour thing. And they went, cool. And they went away and animated it. So we ended up with this half hour web online comedy thing. Um, again, it was kind of, I went back to the Bowie thing of the way of animating that to try and do it really quickly. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, because it costs so much money to create half an hour of animation. But actually, because we already had the story, we, yeah, we were just mm. looking for a simple way of doing it, and we're able to do it in quite a cost-effective way. 
Yeah. And uh, it was great just to see it, you know, come to life. So I think I've got a clip of this. This is the first little bit of it. So this is uh, the badly animated sci-fi spectacular. Yeah, lo-fi sci-fi. Yeah. There it is again, Captain. I told you, ignore it. What is it, Ensign Winger? A distress signal, ma'am. I've found if you just ignore them, they eventually stop calling. But Starlactica's rules state we must respond to all distress calls. One day, Winger, I am going to find your off button. Afraid of what we might find, Captain. Afraid, number two. You remember the last distress call? She was old. It wasn't her fault. Red alert, top speed, five days of space travel with no sleep. For what? Oh, thank you so much, Captain. They really do put these lids on too tight. That was a one-off. Really? What about the time in Taylog Prime? I don't remember. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's a blur. Exactly. No one remembers. But now we've all got a tattoo on our bottom saying I love Bruno. Is that where that came from? Distress calls are just pranks or cranks. They know we've got to come, that's why they do it. That's why we're not going to respond. If I was captain, we'd be leaping to the rescue. Yes, leaping without looking. Meaning what? Remember the Florbodian ambassador? I just thought the guest quarters were a little breezy. They were supposed to be. The Florbodians live on an ice planet. I scooped him up, didn't I? We'll never get that stain out of the carpet. I'm just saying, if I was captain, I'd do things differently. But you're not captain, number two. You're number two, number two. Hence the number two, number two. It's not as if we have anything better to do. Nothing's happened for days. I know. It's fantastic. It's boring. No hostile aliens or stars going supernova or dangerous spatial phenomena that could end our lives in some new and surprising way. Fine. Take a break. I'll run this mission. Not a good idea. I think you're threatened by me. Really? Because unlike you, I have all the instincts of a leader. Ensign Winger, would you like number two to be your new captain? No, sir. Why not? I don't want to die young, sir. Exactly. I'm captain, and I say we're not going. Of course. Under Starlactican Code 5, Section 7, any captain refusing to attend a distress call can be demoted to ship's cook effective immediately. Really? In that case... Oh, a distress call. I thought you said a de-stress crawl, which, as we all know, is a kind of spa holiday where you walk like a crab. But now you've cleared that up, Ensign, you little puke. Let's see if we can help. There you go, so that's episode one. So that took me a day. So that I used a lot of the skill stuff I'd done from Bowie to be able to do that. Um, so do stuff for free if... So these are the music videos I did. Um, and they just came along because there were people I knew. I liked the song. I had a bit of time. And I was playing around with different styles of doing stuff at the time. So at the time I was doing all these crazy kind of detailed psychedelic drawings. And... Um, and there wasn't any budget for this, but I was like, okay, that this might be an opportunity for me to make something in a style I wanted to and get it out into the world. Because but, but he was a signed artist. Oh, they are signed. Like, yeah, yeah, these are guys that are signed. They're not... Um, uh, so that was um, that one. Um, and then, so that's all the artwork for it. Essentially, it was one long pan, so I created this massive, long kind of landscape thing. And obviously, you can see it's really different to the Starship style because it's much more colourful. It took a lot longer to do. I think that was four months or something all together. Um, I did a music video for Tim Burgess, if you don't know, know Tim Burgess. He was the lead singer of the Charlatans, um, who I used to go and see when I was like younger. So it was fun to go and do something with him. Again, I had a bit of time, and it was using a slightly different style that I'd done before. So it was a kind of a research and development in a way. Um, awards. Um, we have got a weird relationship with awards because they're a strange thing. We were talking about on the way down about, you know, if you were in a running race and you win it, then you've won. But if you're being judged on an artistic thing, it's a bit of a... It can be a bit awkward, but, you know, we did win one. Um, so uh, we went to BAFTA in 1919? 19? 19, 19, 19, 20. 2011. 2011, know where I am. Um, which was for a psychedelic maths programme we did. Um, and the takeaways from that are, get a decent haircut, buy a suit that fits, don't wear a white suit, <laughs> and don't dance while holding a BAFTA. I pulled a muscle in my leg and it was very painful. Yeah, there you go. That suit didn't fit me and Moles was very... Well. It, it was quite a nice one to win for because they kind of... You know, some projects, they say, here are the, here's the remit for what we want you to do, and they fiddle a lot. And actually, this one, they, they, they just said, we want a, um, a primary... We're doing primary maths, and we want it to be a bit like the Beatles' Yellow Submarine in terms of tone. And, uh, and then just kind of let us get on with it. So... And actually, this time we were especially doing a thing where every time we did a new project, we would 
try and do something that we hadn't done before. So I think on this one, we started working with other voice artists more. We tended to do most of it ourselves before that. Um, and then, you know, another project we might like, start working with composers, and another project we might start working with a, a bigger um, animation team. So we were always trying to, every time we did a new project, we tried to skill ourselves up a little bit by doing something slightly differently. Um, yeah. But that no. did help us get some, um, I mean, the award helped because, you know, we've, we were relatively obscure. Uh, uh, you know, from we were, we're not from London. We don't. We did. We did discuss whether we should move to London at some point, um, which certainly has its benefits. But actually, uh, you know, the, the industry is kind of spread across the the country now. So yeah. So this is. Uh, we just thought I'd go through some. This is us developing new work. These are all current projects that we're going to be pitching soon. Give you an idea about how we do that and then we're going to go through a whole quickly go through a whole bible which is our main one we're pitching at the moment to show you the kind of thing you might want to put together if you're going to pitch now with like with all the other streaming networks there are more opportunities you know there are more people you can pitch to and uh, we try to go to Annecy Film Festival um, each year as well um, and you know and really the, a lot of these festivals even though there might be an animation festival there's usually something going on to do with like games as well as writing and to do with illustration yeah. to do with kids tv and to do with you know adult tv ideas like the guys from titmouse who do all the kind of uh uh what do they do rick and morty and rick and morty and the other one big mouth and stuff there they all go to annecy too so you can connect internationally with people at some of these more uh bigger industry yeah. events so these are just this is just for me basically putting together loads of image like images so people can see what the show is going to look like and get a feel for it and feel for some of the characters um what, where it is and those kind of things. Um, this is a, a more of a graphic novel pitch, but this is stuff. Um, and again, it comes to that showing people stuff. Like here's the images. This is what the show is going to look like. This is. And the they don't have vibe. to be the final images because things often go through further development. But yeah, having images usually does. If you're doing like a pitch bible or a couple of pages, it usually has a lot more impact. Yeah. I mean, sometimes if I'm pitching something because I'm not an illustrator, I'll just write a page pitch and then create a mood board from other pictures but obviously it's nicer if you can actually yeah so this is um we get asked a lot what does a bible look like um so this is the show we're currently pitching at the moment and we just got some more money to do um some more development on it but this is essentially is what we're using as the sales tool so when we go out and meet people they get the seat to see this so basically you give them a synopsis usually you have to give them a really quick log line so they can read it and go okay get it um really quickly and if they like that they can then delve deep into it Things like what's the premise of the whole thing, um, the tone and the themes of it, you're going to a lot of detail because you will get asked all these questions. So if you've already addressed them first, it's really good to have all that. Um, personal inspiration is something we were told by a, a guy um, who did Bojack. So it's really good to put that in there because then they get a sense of why you're doing it in the first place. You're not just doing it out of some cynical reason. You're actually going, this is why we want to make this show. Um, this is what we're into. This is what we're about. Um, and then it's about you know who are the characters and that kind of stuff. So you just go through and you know give them a really detailed view of who the characters are, why they might work together as a set. It's all those, and this is just more more characters. And then the world building is really about like where is it being set and why is that relevant and why is it relevant to the characters. Um, so it's just all the different locations and then just a load of imagery of stuff and like where it is and all those kinds of things. That's the shop. And then the places, so we give them a sense of the different. And the reality is, you'll end up if you. you this is the kind of thing you're in, interested in doing. You'll, you'll end up creating plenty of things that never, <laughs> never make it beyond this. Um, or maybe you make it like this, and then oh, I'm going to do a graphic novel of this, or I'm going to write a book of this, or I'm going to make a game of this. You know, instead of what you originally intended, because um, you know ideas kind of flow in that way. But th none of it's wasted because you know every time you're doing it, you're kind of exercising those muscles of like oh. Uh, what's exciting me now, and uh, uh, and how do, how do, what's the world look like, and what what kind of characters are we using, and uh, yeah, it's all about. I guess it's tying in the words with the pictures, making sure they're excited about what the world looks like, and that it reads well on the page, and the, and the idea is super clear. Um, so that's that, and then things about like what's what's going to be in each every episode, or what's the series going to feel like, um, and what happens overall, or what happens in each episode. So that's quite a lot of information for them to read about that. Because if they're really into the idea, they don't mind delving in a little but, bit more. But, but sometimes, I mean, this is quite developed because we had um, some money for it. But uh, the because we actually applied for some funds to from the BFI, which again another scheme which came along and has disappeared already. 
Uh, but always kind of keeping out for soft. I think we're talking about funds in a minute, aren't we? So, yeah, we're going to do that in a minute. So, um, so again, a series of story ideas. But and the some, more you can put in there, the but some pitch. I mean, some pitches will just be like two pages. It'll be a really nice picture, and then the summary. In this one, we were able to have gone into a lot more detail. Yeah. So then, just some information about yeah, us. Say who you are as well. <laughs> so okay, to have multiple ideas, but focus on your favourite and make the Bible comprehensive. If you're doing a full Bible, so there you go. I think I've spelt that right. There's no grammatical so. errors. Uh -huh. yeah. Embrace the random. So this is a little bit about we we've ended up doing some weird stuff just because people have asked us to, and we've gone okay, cool. So we've done a whole bunch of books. Like we were asked to do a book about how to have ideas and what to do with them, and then we were asked to do a book about dogs. So well, I think you came up with that idea with did I? our sister. Caroline, didn't you? You've been just thought people like dogs, don't they? Let's pitch this to our agent, and then which is ironic because I don't, not that I don't like dogs. Greg's allergic to dogs. I'm allergic to them, but, and, uh, and I don't understand. But the because usually picking. when you pitch things, it take you know it's like no or no. And <laughs> that was one of those occasions where we pitched the idea, and they went yes almost straight away, and it was published by Penguin Random House, and they, went around the world and stuff. Yeah, so that was bit. so. Sometimes that's a the kind of weird thing is like sometimes you feel like you're knocking your head against a brick wall. And other times things happen very easily, but not not very often. Yeah. But, um, and then I've been quite quiet recently. And someone came along and said they gave me a plan of a new petrol station unit thing and said, "Can you do a? Can you draw that?" And I went, "Yeah, all right. There you go." And because they're architects, they've got loads of money. I was like, "Wow, this is great." <laughs> so I I, had to, I was given a plan of that and I had to draw it again. Really weird, random thing, but it was like, "Okay, I can draw." I imagined it was just an animation background and drew it, and they really liked it. So sometimes you might get offered something weird, and then I do stuff like round town. I like as a you know the beer shop or the coffee shop or anything else. If they want some drawing, I'll, I'll usually draw for beer or food or <laughs> coffee or, you do know, we, so. Do, do we have a bit about the A, B and C stream thing later on? We don't. But because we actually, when we first started out, um, uh, the first job we actually did, well, Greg was working on, and, and I kind of came in to help a bit at the end, was, was for a change management company, and they were making an animation about... Uh, the kind of changes that happen in a company, particularly if a company goes from, like, you know, 80 people, they suddenly get some seed funding and they suddenly have 1,500 people working for them and they bring in like a change management company who charge them an absolute fortune um, and to help them with the culture change. And Greg was making an animation for it and, and Alan, who was one of the guys there, said to us, because we were really, really new at the time, he said, think of your incomes as A, B and C. As for instance, occasionally you'll get an A. It'll pay probably enough money for like... Like the Disney job. The Disney like job a whole year. Happen. And you'll be like, wow, this is brilliant. Those don't come along very often. But, you know, uh, recognise them. And he says, you're more likely to get, you know, a few Bs, which pay pretty well, but you'll need a few of those through the year, like, you know, four or five. And, uh, and then you'll have a lot of Cs, which are things that pay, you know, enough for half a month or a week or a month. And you're going to get a lot of those, you know. So it's kind of trying to manage as a freelancer to get a mix of A, B and C going on all the time so that, because there will be times where you don't have any A and any B and that's when you'll need all your little Cs to keep yeah. you going. So it's kind of, uh, and the other weird, I was actually tied into that is the idea that, you know, a lot of culture tells us, oh, uh, you know, you start here and then you kind of get promoted and then, you, you know, things get better and eventually you're like up here somewhere and you're making loads of money. Well, if you're in the creative arts, I think it's probably more like you're making no money, you're making some money. You know, you made no money. You made no money. You made some money. You know, <laughs> yeah. and, and our accountant calls it... Uh, Calls it the, calls it lumpy business because that's what it's like I think in in being a freelance in the arts. So if you one year you're not making much money, it doesn't mean you're shit. Mm. It just means you might make more money next year and the money after you know. So it's just a little bit like up yeah. and down. Doing we'll race we through do. this a bit because this is the kind of businessy bit. But so other things to consider: uh, passive income streams. So when you're writing or directing, there are if you register for these places, you can get some payment back payments out of stuff. ACA, ALCS Mars gets money. If something's transmitted written. on TV, I get some royalties. Yeah. And I get them for direct directing as well. So you get little bits of money coming back. In the same way, PRS, if you write music, you might get some music. And then with the books, it's uh, called PLR. And there are foreign collecting agencies if you're shown anywhere else. So there are little bits of money that will come back to you uh, if you register for the right thing. So always make sure if you're doing anything, um, you're registered with the right people if there's going to be money coming back to you. Um, Development for third parties. So what we just showed you with Hat Magic, we've done that for other people. So we've yeah. developed shows and Bibles for other people. And that was actually one of the first jobs we did uh, in 2005 was Pedro and Frankensheet. We had the CBBC had seen, again, something we'd done and stuck online. And everyone went, oh, that's great. And, and off the back of something we did, again, someone came to us and said, oh, can you help us with our existing show? They had 
maybe three or four pages a Pedro and Frankensheep that they'd come up with. They had 10 episodes, five minutes each, and we helped to further develop it and then yeah. make it. Um, talks, like what we're doing now, you know, we've done quite a few of those. It's a good way of not just getting out, which is good, meeting people and doing something a bit different, because obviously with animation, there's a lot of sitting in your room doing nothing on your own. Well, not doing nothing, but on your own. Um, funding, there is still bits of funding out there. It's not as easy as it was, but it's still there. If you, I, you know, if you I think it's just one of those things that's always changing, isn't yeah. it? Because there's soft money, you know, where you apply to get stuff. Is always Someone's always going, oh, I'm not sure that's worked the way we wanted to. Or there's a politician going, oh, we need to make slash spending and, uh, oh, let's, uh, the arts. There no, is a, we don't need arts. There's a BFI uh, fund that's just gone again, which is for young filmmakers, and that's quite good money there for short films. So yeah. if you check out the BFI site, there's always something going on there. Um, how much to charge? We get asked it all the time. So there's different... We'll go through it quickly, but there's rate cards which says how much you should be being paid for certain, certain jobs, especially in computer gaming. And they and often animation. come from like unions, like Writers Guild or... Uh, uh, I've completely forgotten the name of the uh, the, the union for TV, but yeah, Pact. That's, yeah, packed, Pact, yeah. yeah, and so they can be very useful. Yeah. Day rate. I mean, I've got you know, I've got a sort of one day rate for certain things and other things, but really, if you got if you know how much you're worth for a day, it's good to know because if someone comes and asks you, you've got you go well, this is a day rate for that. Um, producers will help as well if you're working on a bigger show; they'll work all that out. Um, working out how to do a budget is a really good thing because if someone comes along, like a Disney people came along and said, we've got this much money, but can you give us a budget? We had to re-engineer, backward engineer a budget to justify us getting the money they were giving us. So that's good to know. Um, sometimes you'll get, it'll be, it'll be per, for the rest of our animation, sometimes it's per minute, other times it'll be per project and that will just be the diff, diff, you know, different jobs. And working also out, different projects will, will attract different amounts of money it's not like you go this is now what i charge for everything you know because you might get i remember we did a job for tate once with the tate um, uh, galleries in london for uh, for the kids site and it wasn't particularly well paid but it was a really nice job and nice people to work with so we did that for a bit less than we normally did yeah and then you know working out scheduling because people ask how long is it going to take you so know how long it's going to take yeah. to do the and you'll often bits. have to do that at the same time as yeah. just to justify if you say, oh, it's going to cost this much, and they say, but you've only scheduled a week of something in for yeah. that, you'll be like, oh, yeah. I need to, you know, so. And then we always try and get 50% up front of the fee. It doesn't always work, but if you ask for it and you get it, then that's great. Sometimes obviously. you get 25, but yeah. you, know, some, you need something to get going. you know. And then contracts and copyright is just, you know, that's on job by job, but if you're a member of like our Association of Illustrators or somewhere like that, they've got loads of great stuff to help you out. And I think they do reduce rates on students. A lot, a lot of the unions do. Society of Authors have a a legal team and we we have an agent now and so she's able to help with a lot of those things yeah um festivals are great i mean the two big one we did annecy which is essentially the glastonbury of the animation world <laughs> uh, in this beautiful setting with mountains and lots of bars and stuff which is really good fun that's, and we got yeah, to go to uh, that's the bon leo that's a massive cinema and then this was um us in uh, sundance for when we showed martha out there uh, which was great very cold and we felt very weird because of the uh because the altitude we didn't realize it was like 2,000 metres above sea level. Yeah. We, only, we only read the you... don't drink on the first night after we'd drunk yeah. on the first night. And also night. don't use the, yeah, don't go to the gym after we've been to no, the hotel no. gym. Yeah. Um, wh where are we at at the moment? Conferences, looking at they're good to go One o'clock, so anyone... Competitions, they're good to do. Yeah. So get out there, be visible and search out opportunities. I think that's the, there are, they are there if you, uh, if you kind of put yourself out there. So we'll do a quick, how long we got? Well, Oh, do you want a, a comfort break since it's Anyone an want a comfort break or do we carry on? Who wants a comfort break? Put your hand so, up. Do I, do I, do no, really. Right, oh, one person. <laughs> there you go. Let's have, a, let's have five, five minutes and we'll restart again. And yeah, then do, cool. And we'll talk about one of our films yeah. uh, as a case study. So if we're Talk ever, amongst yourself. And then you one. can come back. In, yeah, we'll restart five minutes. Five minutes yeah. yeah, sweet.
We're back. Oh, uh, right. Back in the room. Da, 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 da. So that that what we just talked about was really kind of like, you know, what to do, how to do it, what not to do. Um, but we thought we'd do a little case study of one of the films we've made um, and give you a little bit of an insight as to how it was made and why we made it. And this is just a purely p personal um, film. And the, the way it came about, I'll just show you, this is Martha's. The way this came about was 365, the film we made, uh, we did it to lots of festivals. I've got a friend who's a, a journalist out in America who writes very, very kind of powerful pieces about, um, about uh, very political kind of stuff. And uh, he'd made a film about the, the, uh, the death penalty. And he said, have you submitted your film to Martha? And I was like, never heard of it. He goes, will you submit yours? If I su I'll submit mine, if we both get in, we'll do a road trip. So we did, and we both got in. So I was like, we'd never done a documentary before, so it was like, really fun to, um, to try doing a, a documentary kind of thing. So I had no idea though what that would be, whether it would be a travel travel journalism piece, or I just knew I wanted to make a film about the trip, um, and so that's that was the starting point. And we were we were lucky; we did a little Kickstarter campaign, and we managed to raise enough money, basically just to get me there. Um, so Marfa's a tiny little town um, on the West Te West Texan desert, very near to the Mexican border. Um, it's a really strange little place. It's like um, Brighton in the middle of the desert, basically very hipstery. Um, made famous in the 60s by an, art, an artist called Donald Judd who bought up the, a lot of the, the buildings and converted them into art and galleries. There's a famous, is it James Dean film set there yeah, as well? Yeah, the film Giant yeah. was filmed there. Um, and it looks like this. It's, a, it's what you'd imagine. It's amazing. It's a beautiful place. Um, it's uh, lots of trucks and lots of abandoned alleyway things. I, I didn't go, by the way, because I was about to become a father. So, no, I, was... <laughs> so I had to go on my own. So Greg had to go on his own. Um, so it's, it's pretty much like that. I mean, the, we had to drive from Austin to Marfa, and that's all I saw for nine hours. It was just literally like that. Um, so setting the star was, was kind of coming off the back of 365. In my head, I was, I'd loved that style so much. It had been very successful. I was like, OK, let's just carry on and do that. Um, so I just started drawing everything in the same style. But I just, I somehow there was something about it just didn't connect with the with with what I was doing. I it just didn't feel right somehow for the place. But I did obviously loads of drawing and and all these different images. But it it didn't sit right. And and this is something that's a kind of feature of Greg's work throughout the time we've been working is, uh, you know, he will kind of evolve it. I think when we 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 first started, everything was super graphic, wasn't it? And remember, you did everything in the computer and really graphic style for a while. Yeah, it's very cartoon network. Yeah, yeah. and then you kind of evolved into more hand-drawn. So Greg's always kind of like been looking to, you know, what's the next, you know, evolution of the and style. It, whether it's, it's hard to quantify, but it's usually whether, what it feels like. And the Martha didn't feel like a very graphic-y kind of... So I was... I just carried on. I did some prototyping, so this is these are little clips and little ideas that I had along the way. So I'm not just drawing stuff; I'm making stuff as well. And we had the, the, initially we had this idea that I'd be the film would be me explaining to my brother in a coffee shop what the trip was like. But it was like, oh my God, this is so boring. It's like, here's some holiday photographs I've done. It was like really dull. Then I had this idea to do this kind of Cine 8 kind of thing, which is all kind of like this. And it, it, that, that didn't appeal to me either. And I, I, was really, I was really struggling. I was struggling with the style of it and I was struggling with the story. But we'd been given this money by Kickstarter and all these people had chipped in. And one person had put a grand in. It was like, I've got to make this film somehow. Yeah, so it was then, an unusual pressure, wasn't it? Because we hadn't put ourselves in that position before. Like, usually when we made our own things, it was just our own money, wasn't it? Yeah. Usually because we'd had a nice job from somewhere and we put a little bit of money aside towards what we wanted to do. And 365 had its own kind of, like, framework because it was a second a day. Yeah. It was, so it was this This wasn't like that. And three and having the Kickstarter did put us under pressure to, like... We suddenly had an audience, but no film. Yeah, and then I had one thing we got when we were driving into Moff, we got pulled over by the police. So I wanted to put that story in. And I've got a friend who works for Blur Studios in LA that do all the game trailers. I was like, we should have one bit in the film where it's like full on CG. So I made this for her and got a quote for it. So this is the, this is the kind of clip. This is me being pulled over by the police in my brain.
Turns out CGR is very expensive. 120 grand <laughs> for that, if it was done full CG. So we didn't go down that route. But also, like, the tone of that is so different to the final film. Yeah, yeah, well. so... Again, we're still, still trying again, to find it's like, out. Yeah, like you're trying things out and yeah. seeing how it feels. This was the police officer that pulled us over and there was no, there was no guns. So I was struggling. I went back to the sketchbook so I'd done when I was there and started to like, get really attracted by the idea of like, okay, what if I did it as though it was a sketchbook? That would be, maybe, would that work? And kind of the more I thought about it, the more I looked at it, and all of my sketchbooks are square, which ties in, you'll see why in a minute, with the film. So started going down that, that route. Then I, I went to a festival in Bristol and saw these short films by this uh, uh, Italian filmmaker from the 50s and they were all these little films and they were just like little vignettes of uh, at the back end of things like the way they used to fish and the, the festivals they used to have on the Isles of Sicily and they were so beautiful there was no dialogue there was no explanations there was just music and there was just like these shots that were really cool and it really inspired me to go actually maybe that's the tone I want to get across I don't want to tell a like here's me on holiday story it's more here's the place here's what it feels like and that kind of set me off in a whole new direction so exposing yourself to like stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily watch or, or random things or interesting documentaries from different eras or different places is always a quite a cool thing to do. So constructing the narrative, that sounds very official. Anyway, um, I collected so much stuff, loads of photographs, loads of audio, loads of clips and films, just from the, to get a sense of the place. Um, crazy, lot of photo, this whole thing about you can adopt a dog, all kinds of stuff. Um, went to loads of gigs, just did loads of things while I was there. Um, collected loads of audio, so that I, this is just a little bit of it. Lo like interviews, the sound of what the church bells were like, as much as I possibly could. Not and not like worrying about what I was going to use it for. It was just collect as much information as you possibly can. Um, and then what happened then was it was like we had all this stuff. Um, and we needed something to tie it all down. I hadn't, at the start, I had this idea that there would be a poem in the middle of it. And I really like old 60s beat stuff, Kerouac and, and Ginsberg. So I asked Miles, I said, well, here's all the information. Here's all the photographs. Here's all the audio. Can you write me a poem in that style? And, and yeah, I just thought, well, I looked at all the photographs and just kind of collected together. You know, because when you go to a place, one of the interesting things is just the names of places, you know, um, uh, like Howard Petroleum, you know, and, and things like that were kind of fun. And the, the Kay Burnett studio where Greg got interviewed mm. uh, in the, the, for the radio, like Quintana's and places like that. And, and the, the, it was like a giant lemon where you could get lemonade. And so I kind of put them all in a, in a row and, uh, and then just arranged them so it had a kind of... Uh, a rhythm to it and yeah we thought this would just be one piece of the film yeah like so there would be this bit then this bit then this bit then there'd be the poem then there'd be this bit but that's not quite yeah so then we got um, i met this actress out there called stephanie Hunt who had this amazing texan accent so i phoned her up and just said look would you read the poem for us which she did and she read it in a very she read it in two ways she read it really quickly and then she read it super slow and it was like that is brilliant and then i'd collected a load of music as well that was inspiring me to think about how it was going to be um and then um, started to animate it. But what I did with the audio is we create, created an audio kind of picture. We did all the audio first. And what happened with the poem was it didn't fit as one thing, but it did fit if you interjected it through the whole piece. And what that did was it anchored the whole film down to this poem. So wherever you went and whatever you did, you kept coming back to the poem. And that formed the kind of backbone spine of it. Um, so this is it was all animated by hand in ink and watercolour. It took ages. This is our office covered in bits and stuff. Um, lots of scanning, lots of mess. Um, this was like, because of all the stuff I collected, one of the things was I'd go down and I'd film stuff. And there's a train line that goes right through the middle of the town, literally cuts the town in half. And it had that kind of typical American sound, the sound of the train. So I wanted to go and I wanted to capture that in one shot, just not to use, but just for the sound. And I captured it, and you, I won't tell you what happens, but you have to, you'll see it at the end. And I was speaking to uh, someone I'd worked with, and I said, I don't know how to use this shot. And she just went, just put it at the end. Just put the whole shot at the end of the film. And I went, OK, and I did, and it, it really works really well. And that's just me taking advice from somebody who is a live action filmmaker with a bit of, you know, so you're getting a, an opinion from somebody, you've, you value their opinion. It gives you an, an extra little twist of the film. So yeah, sometimes it's good to ask other people's advice and, and take it sometimes. So this was the edit. It was really boring, unless you like Premiere. <coughs> um, 
So this shows you the anim what my animatics look like versus what the actual final thing looks like. <laughs> so it's just a quick, quick clip should show you how crap my animatics are or how much you can get away with. And uh, like at that moment, guests, for some yeah, reason, do, the parrot decided to go <laughs> <laughs> real loud, you know? Barbado, Presidio, Alpine, Valentine, 34 miles, or City Hall just here. There you go. I think that is because actually sometimes working fast at that moment is helpful, isn't it? It's like doing a sketch essentially. Yeah. Yeah. So we already had the audio. Um, and I've not worked like that before. We usually do the th thing, then do the audio. But because we've got that, especially if the animatic is for yourself, you know, if you're having to show it to clients and things, then obviously it makes sense to be more detailed. But if you're creating something and you know it's for yourself, you don't have to go into quite so much detail if you just want to get it done and you want to see if it works all as a piece because you'll be able to make that leap of imagination which a client might not be able to yeah so and the whole film took about a year to make i think once we got going on it it's all hand drawn which i hadn't done before and you've got you got we've got a couple of minutes couple of minutes in and went why am i doing it like and this there's, there's a song uh at the end isn't there which was because when greg was traveling with his friend uh, alex uh, alex was just playing a lot of uh, kind of I had to listen uh, to country Al rock, James yeah. Aldean, yeah, yeah, country rock, cheesy. It's like Bon Jovi, but country. It's but, like, but we yeah. have a, a very talented uh, musician friend who managed to create a kind of similar type of song for the end. Uh, and all the audio, pretty much all the audio, was done on an iPhone. So we it was all recorded on an iPhone, and then we had it mixed just to make it. Um, we had to get permission for those. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. All the interviews you hear, I didn't get permission to do. I had to then get in touch with them later and go, "Oh, by the way, I've made a film about you. Um, do you mind if we use it?" There's one voice in there I didn't get permission for, but usually you'd get permission. The thing I found though was, if you ask permission, you get a very, very different interview. And I was yeah. doing a lot of leaving my phone on the bar. And so a lot of, most of what you hear was just a phone so on the bar. It was an example of asking for forgiveness rather than asking for permission, because, and which led to, yeah, more genuine kind of conversation. And, and actually, the, the one guy that features a lot in it, he actually, I think, introduced the film when at, at Mar for another yeah. year, didn't he, when it yeah. was Yeah, so the shown. guy that talks about um, being, being threatened with a knife, he actually, I, asked, I got in touch with him later, asked his permission, he said yes. And when the film showed him Mar and I couldn't go, he introduced it. And they showed it in the desert, on a screen in the desert. So that was quite cool. I should have, would have liked to have been there. But. So anyway, all of that, we'll show you the final film. So it's Martha. Um, it got nominated for a BAFTA and did really, went to Sundance and did some really cool stuff. So for a project I was struggling with, in the end it did really well, so stick at it. The danger when you're our age is to, that you will be reduced to a set of anecdotes. Marfa. Hotel Paisano, Kastner Motor Co. Ballroom. And we opened up the double doors of the BW bus and said, okay, anybody going north, get in. <laughs> There's a little ridge down through the middle. That's the only place that's above about 10 meters above sea level. It's an amazingly flat place. Last Horse Saloon. 93.5 FM Marfa Public Radio in the K. Burnett Studio. <laughs> He took his final breaths and that was it. Then he turned grey before my eyes. The life literally sucked out of him. It happened so quickly. And six minutes after they began injecting the drugs, a doctor pronounced him dead. Just because and the, like at that moment, guests, for some reason, do, the parrot that. decided to go <laughs> <laughs> real loud, you know? Barbado, Presidio, Alpine, Valentine, 34 miles or City Hall just here. The Texas wave is so polite when you're driving. And I started doing it when I was back in LA and it's one of these things so you're, you're holding on to the driving wheel and when you, when you pass anybody or you're at a stop sign, it's literally, you're still holding and you just do that. Everybody waves at each other That's when they're passing. I love about living here. They were the only people we knew in all of Mexico. Livingston's Hamilton.
I'm pretty sure I'm gonna fucking die right now. That was so amazing. John has so many stories. Long before I met him, it's like the stories. Bright Building, 1831. Howard Petroleum. Yellow on black fire truck. Sky high silver water butt. There's no petty crime. Like, the only stuff is like border patrol. It's, it's light. It really is lights. It's, it's in, it has to be car lights in, from a, from over a hill in near pitch black. There are lights that behave in a way that are very, very confounding. Farm Road 1112. Big Ben Sentinel. What it basically was, it broke down to, was that there was people, people, as they saw it, breaking into women's houses, not stealing anything, not nicking anything at all, but just wanking over all of their stuff. It was kind of disgusting. The name is perfect. That was what it was called around the town, the Marfa Vaders. Brilliant. I couldn't even figure it. It's just hilarious. Palace. Padres. I had a Volkswagen bus, and I still was pitching up, picking up hitchhikers. And when I got into San Francisco, there were two guys hitchhiking, and uh, I said, "Well, it looks like you guys are going down toward North Beach, so yeah, you can you can have a ride. Get in." Two minutes, two minutes later, mm. I had a knife at my throat, and, a, and another guy sitting across from me, a knife at knife at my rib cage, you know. Jeez. And they were screaming. They were like on speed or something, you know, speed freaks. Yeah. Dobra Pajalvats. That's welcome in Russian. Like Martha's Marfa. Prada. Planet Marfa. Bobby Fisher. Riva. Orders here. Lone Star beer marked with a 12. Maya's, Christopher's. These guys are not just ordinary collection of people. These are the most amazing freaks you've ever seen. Main Street Marfa gifts. God damn, the mosquitoes are everywhere. <laughs> Roy's Automotives. A barber. Quintana's. West Texas Utilities. Food shark, cash and check, please. And a kid in denim at the giant lemon. Um, about four minutes of the train system. The, the, the only thing about it was 
for that guy coming across. I didn't notice that at the time. I only noticed it when I showed Miles later on. But this old guy, who obviously lives in Marfa, knows how long this train is and how long it's going to take to go through, was willing to take the risk of getting hit by it just for his newspaper. Because that, that was the thing Greg, Greg showed this movie because he was excited to have that. You know, we've watched like Back to the Future and things as kids, and there's that particular noise that trains make out in the US. And Greg was excited to, to get that. <laughs> he showed his movie and was like, oh my God, look at that guy. <laughs> but yeah, but, but I had to blur his face out, otherwise yeah. I could have got sued. So. Yeah. yeah, but the look on his face was of pure contempt for the train. It was brilliant. So that's Marfa. Yeah. That's yeah, a lot yeah. of freight. It is a lot of train. It goes on forever. It just yeah. goes on and on. Well, that's and on. kind of the point, really, isn't it? Yeah. Kind of. So, anyway, there you go. Um, so, the takeaway from the whole thing work hard, have fun, be professional, do the admin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, you've got to go, you got to get the right budget. Invoicing. Yeah. Invoicing, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> So I guess we'll do some questions and answers now. Yeah. Right? If you've got any questions about writing yeah. or about animation or about yeah. illustration or about you know or a, anything or any <laughs> you know business side of things or or career side of things or anything like that. So yeah. Oh, here we go. Hello. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, how did you um, first kickstart your careers as um, freelancers? Like, how did you get to where you are now, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the things, we, when we would, before we started the Brothers McLeod Limited, uh, we were working uh, in a bigger family business with my dad and my sister, and we were kind of doing like e-learning and stuff like that, but we were, we were kind of making our own little animations. And then we got... Uh, Pedro and Frank had sheet, didn't we? So we, what, got, one, what yeah, we, we got, got a job that was mm. going to take us probably nine months to 12 months. But prior to that, we made we made a film called Fuggy Fuggy, which was like the thing that got us noticed. We'd, we'd made loads of rubbish stuff. We kept making things and making things and making things and just showing them to our mates. Got to a point where we made Fuggy Fuggy, which was like a five-minute non-dialogue comedy thing, like a, kind of like a slapsticky thing. Properly animated. Properly animated. We, we hired somebody to come and help us. And we put that out, and that got us noticed. So we made like a, a piece of work that people that got us noticed, and so that wasn't we, that was off our own backs. But before prior to that, we made, and then off the back of that, we got an introduction into Wardman, and we got, uh, and then Pedro and Frank and Sheep yeah. off. So basically, since we got people being interested in us, we didn't let that go. We were like, no, hello, hello. Yeah. So I guess that was it. We did a piece of work that cost us money, really, on some level, and then. Because that got us noticed, we then got these yeah these two jobs. Uh, we were doing commercials for Arpan at the time, and this Pedro and Frank sheep job, which was a nice step. And because we went right, these are two nice, like B maybe a, one was an A job and the other one was maybe a B job. Like well, let's set up a business, let's, and let's concentrate on this, and at the same time carry on doing. And we made like we say there we made ourselves visible. We went to the festivals and the conferences, and we suddenly kind of were yeah. about, and people we were in people's consciousness then. So I think that's. Yeah, I, I think that was it. We kind of took that opportunity of having a slightly bigger job to say, right, this is the beginning of a new thing, and then tried to keep it going afterwards. But yeah, so it was uh, that was how it started for us, anyway. Yeah. Anybody else? <gasps> oh. um, what's your advice to like students who want to start a series? To start a series, yeah. So you're like your own idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, basically, um, the uh, I guess the thing is to try and get hold of. I mean, I mean, like the one we showed you here with the deck is to first of all, I guess you need to come up with the idea and you need to write it down. You need to make it look great, and then obviously it's really just about networking and meeting people because find out um, find out for the different companies like every company Netflix or they'll all have somebody. Who is like an is like a old school music A and R? Someone is looking for talent. Who's looking for new things? So if you've got an idea, even if it's one page, if you can get a really good tagline, one line, then they, they go, oh, that's interesting. Who is this person? Yeah. So make sure and you love your idea because if you're going to work on an idea, like for a show like Circle Square, we were on it for two years. You've got to like the idea. Don't try and come up with something you think they're going to like. Come up with something you like, and then make the. They'll have a, like a signature image, this is what it's going to look like, and a great tagline, and then find out who the people are in the organisations that are looking for talent, and then I, th I think the thing them. is to try, if you, if you try pitching it to your, you know, your peers, mm. 
because a lot of people in the industry are quite introverted anyway, but, you know, but so people are kind of allowed for that, you know, but I guess at the same time, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm the greatest person at pitching things, but I'm I still, but there are lots of, you know, like uh, industry events, uh, where there are like little pitches or they invite people to do little funny pitching games. They do that at CMC, which is the children's media conference. They often have like slightly joke, half half jokey, half serious kind of pitching sessions. And uh, we, we go to the Annecy Film Festival. You know, there's people all over the world going to the conference there. And again, you know, pitches can be formal in a, an environment like this, or they can just be in a cafe to someone. And then I'd say the other thing to be aware of is... Um, you know, you can pitch direct to a network, like you can pitch to Netflix, you can pitch to, you know, Amazon, you can pitch to Apple, you can pitch to the BBC. But a lot of the time, what can be more useful is to pitch to a, a large independent production company. We've done that before, where we've, we've you go and end up, like, say, um, you find out who makes, uh, if it was a kid's show, maybe like Octonauts, which is made by a company called Silvergate, and you know, or now part of Sony, and you go and pitch to them, and then if they like your idea, they'll work on it with you, and they will then pitch it to Netflix and BBC. And because you're with them, it gives you a bit more power. So you can pitch direct to a network, you can pitch to a, a, a production company, and they'll option your work, and then you work with them and a bigger team, and then they, you, as a whole, you can pitch to the network. So that can be a bit more powerful sometimes. So, so there are, to be aware of that route as well. Any more? Everyone wants to get, get out in the fresh air, I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the back, yep. Need some vitamin D, that's what. Hello. Um, Shriveling up. I got a question. Yep. Uh, how did you guys know like, that you had this talent growing up? Was this something that you were born to do, or was it solely to pay for the bills? <laughs> Um, I was never the best drawer. Drawer? Is that a word? It is now. Drawing a uh, drawer. Uh, um, but I've got a photo of me at one year old and I've drawn all over my mum and dad's kitchen cabinet. So there's obviously, <laughs> whether there's something in me or not, I don't know. But I worked really bloody hard to get good at drawing. I drew every day and all the time. I'm still not the best drawer in the room. but um, It's definitely not for the money. Otherwise, we would have, you know, gone into banking. I mean, we talk about that a lot because if you want to stay in the industry, I guess because, like, you know, where are... You know, our dad started his own business and my mum was a hairdresser and our grandparents were like, you know, works in factories and things. So we know that you've got to make money. You know, we call it making tires sometimes because that's what our grandfather did at Dunlop. You know, and if you want to have a house and <laughs> pay for food, you've got to make money, even if you're doing creative arts. But that's not, I guess, the reason we do it. Um, but we, we're, we're sanguine about the fact that that has to be part of what we're doing as well as trying to create things we just love, which sometimes cost us money. Um, but um, I guess I, d I didn't know specifically I was going to be a writer. I guess well, well, I loved writing, I loved reading, but I, I, um, I think it was only actually when Greg started doing a lot, started going into animation, I thought, oh, I could... Because um, we'd always been friends as well as brothers when we were younger, because obviously a lot of people go, I can't work with my brother or sister. And we did work with our sister as well. Um, uh, so yeah, that's a very long answer to your question, but uh, but uh, but uh, but yeah, I guess because uh, I was able to write, and then Greg was able to turn my words into something visual, it was really exciting. So it was really we had a lot of fun, basically. Yeah, <laughs> that was the the main reason, I think. Any other questions? Let's get some vitamin D, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on, okay, for it. I've got two questions, actually. That's right. Uh, the first one is, how how many years have you guys been doing this? And when it comes to audio and audio effects, do you pay for actors or do you use your own family to do them voices? Or how does it work? Um, how long have we been doing it? Um, so professionally, about 20 we, years? I guess we set up our business in 2007. Yeah. But we've been doing it for about seven years before that, really badly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, say 2007. And then in terms of voices, so... A mix of everything. So, Starship Impossible, Miles did everything. He did all the voices and all the sound. Um, Circle Square, we hired actors, but we do use our family as well. Um, so, a bit of both, really. But it depends on what the budget is. Um, it depends on the project. But, but to start out with, like when we started, yeah, we just did everything ourselves. We did the music, we did the sound effects, which we bought from mostly from Sound Dogs. Yeah. I still use them sometimes, you know, because, and then. Uh, 
and yeah, so and and even there, you can buy like royalty free music as well. So we, yeah, we we did it, we did that as well. But yeah, it, it yeah just just per project, depending on what. And we're we doing. would try to do something new each project. It's what you know that would be the thing. And also with the new with this the one we showed you were pitching, we we're going to try and attach some big names to that because it does help when you're pitching if you go so and so is going to do the voice of whatever. It does help. It pricks the ears of the executives a little bit. So. Any more? Okay, quick question. How do you get to hire actors and gain traction through your productions? So, how do how do you hire actors? Well, most of them have got, uh, that you want to get in touch with will have uh, a voice agent, um, uh, which might often be different to their agent they use for like if they're doing actual. Uh, live action work and usually if you just punch their name in and write voice agent it will you'll usually be able to find their website and you can then contact the voice agent and, and ask and it and you you know if it's for a lower budget project then then be prepared to to say look you know we're this is what we're doing this is what we can afford are they you know if they can't afford their normal fee but you know ask you know because sometimes they will say yes we've i mean we've worked on projects where actors have especially when we started out actors work for less than they did on other projects um and really and sometimes it's just because they, they'll want to read the script and then decide you know so don't be afraid to ask and but also there is a lot of talent uh talented people who aren't as well known so you know be you know be, you know be uh be flexible too Cool. Um, we've got a couple of questions that came through um, online before the talk. Okay. Um, there's a couple that are very similar. Um, so we had, uh, what was your life like before you started your ideas? How did you both kickstart your career? So I think a lot of people in here are a little bit worried because they want to get into creative industry, but they're not sure how to start. Yeah. Uh, how was your kind of journey getting into that like at the very beginning? I think the key is to, we just made stuff. And even when it was rubbish, we made it. We made, and we made things short things. So you make one short thing and it's rubbish, and you go, okay, we'll make the next thing. It's short, or it's a bit better. And then another thing that's, and then you just keep doing that, and eventually you find your voice. But we also shared it with our mates yeah, to begin yeah. with, just to get feedback, you know. And also the other thing about that is, at the beginning, we also tried to fit in with a few trends, and realised that, that wasn't really our sense of humour or wasn't what we wanted to do. So sometimes you do something and we go, oh, yeah, feel like I need a wash. You know, I don't want to do that anymore. That's not my kind of thing. So, it's yeah, the best way is to just to do stuff. Because A, you learn, and B, you've got something at the end of it you can show someone who then might give you a job. Yeah, and build up your knowledge. Like, what, what, are the, what are the places that might commission you? What are the conferences you go to? What are the film festivals you can go to? And as a student, you usually get either discounted or free. So just making yourself aware of stuff and building that knowledge up. Not just the creative bit or the ideas bit. It's what's all the stuff behind it? What's all the machinery that works in the background? It's good to know all that and know the right who the people are. Even if you don't know them, know the names of people. Who's the guy that runs Cartoon Network? Yeah, we were quite cheeky, weren't we? We came up with a show, and we just uh, phoned, <laughs> I think we actually phoned we up. We phoned Cartoon them up, Network. said, "Who is it?" And then we got we a meeting, meeting with, with so and so, and we got a meeting. I think he wondered how we got in there, but um, but uh, be a bit that, even that be, can be work. yes. It's but be friendly, be nice, but be a bit cheeky. And as that well. can help if there's two actually, because then it's a bit yeah. less terrifying than just going on your own. It's true. Take a friend. Take a friend. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. Anyone? Uh, yeah. Ding, ding. <laughs> um, about a month ago, I subscribed to you guys on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so I was going to ask, uh, what other social media platforms do you guys have? So we're on Instagram as at Brothers McLeod. Uh, Twi yeah, yeah. Twitter. Uh, yeah, we're on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn. All the usual suspects. But we're not on. Yeah, I guess it's funny because with YouTube. We we would we used that a lot more in the beginning than we do now. I think uh, before it uh, it used to have a front page, believe it or not, it had just but the, worldwide the, front so, page. Yeah, worldwide front page. The, the stuff that they chose to put on it, and there used to be an email editor at YouTube.com. It used to be able to email with your stuff, and they used to put our stuff on the front page, and so it would get like eight hundred thousand views <laughs> just because we'd sent someone an email. That doesn't work anymore. No, uh, sadly. So uh, we, we, we do still use social media, but I would say it, it gives us a presence, but we haven't had much work off it. The work comes from 
producing things and getting them in front of people and festivals and stuff. But, but it's we good. have had work through. Well, we have had, yeah, a couple of yeah. things. We've had some illustration work off Twitter, but yeah. not loads. But um, it's good to have a presence because then people can go, oh, what do they do? Well, yeah. there they are. So, yeah. Cool. Awesome. I can use my last slide now, look. Oh, yes. There we go. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks, guys. So let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you. For Thank you. Um, okay, folks, so you've got another talk next. So I would say a quick 20-minute break, go get some fresh air, then back in here. Um